Hello and good morning from Germany. I hope everybody's doing fine. Um, and uh, yeah, um, we are having a very, very special guest today. Um, Becky Pell coming live in from Australia today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, her work as a monitor engineer, her other um, fields of work, which are very exciting as well. Um, and um, of course, keep in mind, uh, we want to keep this as uh, interactive as possible. So um, fire away with all your questions and let us know what is interesting you and how we can um, answer questions as much as possible for you guys. All right, um, so Becky Pell. Um, I have uh, met Becky a couple of times. Um, I was uh, lucky to be able to visit her on one of the uh, Anastasia shows um, and see her work and hear her mixes. And I have to say, I'm a big fan. So um, we're going to talk about that, but we're also going to talk about her experience with using Klang at uh, the War of the Worlds uh, by Jeff Wayne. And um, yeah, without any further ado, let's get her in here. Hello, Becky. How are you doing? Hey, Phil. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Fantastic. I'm very, very excited for today. Um, and, I'm um, excited to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> our pleasure. Our pleasure. Hey, um, as um, I, I didn't mention it before, but we actually did a, um, a seminar together. Uh, I think it was two years ago in, in London. Mm. That's um, right, yeah. That was that was really nice. We were guests at uh, the Elisa headquarters in, in London um, and um, had a group of really cool people over there talking about Klang, talking about monitor engineering. And um, I really hope we can repeat that again in person, not just I hope so Skype too. That today. was fun. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. So um, it's uh, early evening for you now, right? Yeah, it's six o'clock. Okay, nice, nice. Okay, so uh, let's hope um, we don't keep you for too long from your dinner plans or whatever you have <laughs> set up for today. <laughs> All right, um, Becky, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you how did you get into the industry um, when you when you get started on the mixing boards? Um, well, I got the bug when I was 12 years old and went to see my first live show and sat behind wow. the front of house guy, realized there was a whole industry behind it. And uh, that was the, the spark was lit. Um, and I didn't have any idea how to get into the industry. But when I left school, I found out there was, there was some studio engineering courses going. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled on one of those. I really wanted to get into live music, but it seemed like a, a foot in the door seemed like a way in. And uh, so I did that and then worked in recording studios for a bit, making tea and sweeping the floor and then wrote to everybody I could find addresses for in the whole of the, the live music industry to, with very little result. Um, and eventually was given a, a chance um, by RG Jones um, Sound Engineering in London, uh, who I still work with to this day, who did the War of the Worlds and I do Glastonbury with them each year. Um, but they gave me a chance as the kid. And I worked my way up uh, through the ranks there and uh, then went freelance after that after being there for about five years. So, yeah, that was my way nice. in. Nice. OK. W what was that first concert when, when you were 12? Do you remember? It was our. Yeah, it was our heart. And in a really nice full circle, I ended up doing monitors for them for about five years. That is so cool. Yeah, it was nice. really cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, 12 year old nice. was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, that's that's actually full circle. Really cool. Um, and did you did you first um, go into the direction of front of house, or was monitors immediately interesting for you from the start? I got a good grounding at Jones's um, in front of house system or all of the the infrastructure, but um, I started doing some monitors on. We had some installations at various TV shows um, at a London studio for independent television in London. Mm -hmm. And 
Fred Jackson, who was um, Bruce Springsteen's monitor engineer, was working at the company at the time. And he kind of took me under his wing and basically taught me how to do monitors. And it just felt very, I felt very at home there. And um, I think he saw something in me that that clicked with with the skills of being a monitor engineer. Yeah. And I just always really enjoyed the vibe of being down that down that end of of the multi core running of the snake. So um, yeah. yeah, I've I've mixed mixed a few front of house shows, mixed some orchestral stuff with uh, front of house, which I quite enjoyed. But yeah, it's always really been monitors for me. Nice, nice. Okay. Um... But um, in the in the in the recent years, it was mostly monitors, right? Did you also do yeah. do different different jobs in the let's say in the in the in the recent periods of time, um, like like teching or like like systems engineering or something like that? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. very much so. Yeah, I was I was I was a monitor tech before I was a monitor you know, engineer. I guess I was I would engineer on smaller jobs, but be teching on on bigger tools for mm. more experienced engineers, which was fantastic because that's. What a great way to learn to mm. to be somebody's technician, um, and then gradually I started getting bigger mixing gigs myself, and you know gradually the, the that overtook the the teching work. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay, um, you're you're based now in Australia, but you're originally from the UK, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Nice. What 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 brought you to yeah, Australia? The, the, oh, my husband Chris Pine is Australian, um, ah, and okay. so we've. We've bounced back and two over the years, but three years ago we decided to to make the move nice. over here full time. Okay. Yeah. Very. So very we live ten minute walk from the beach. It's not it's not too bad. <laughs> oh man, that's that's painful. The jealousy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all right. Okay, so um, that is that is your your audio side, but um, you also have two more sites that I know of. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you are you're um, you're writing for several magazines and, and blogs and you also did um, uh, I think two two or three pieces already about monitoring um, also uh, in regards to to Klang. Yeah. Um, how did that start? I was on tour and somebody asked me if I had a blog and I should write a blog um, and I didn't even really know, really know this was in the early days of well it probably wasn't early days I was probably <laughs> late to the party but <laughs> I didn't know what a blog was um, but I I started doing it and it was good fun I, I just recently started my own website just for um, you know just for, for contact purposes really mm -hmm. and so I started blogging on that and then um, Carrie Keys at Sound Girls um, got in touch. She'd seen something that I'd written and asked if I was interested in blogging for them. Mm -hmm. And that turned into working for them with them for quite a long time, and then writing for Live Sound International, who I work, um, who I write for now. Mm -hmm. So that's been a nice progression. I really enjoy it. Nice, nice. All right. Um, and then, because that doesn't fill your day enough, I suppose <laughs> 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 you're also a uh, yoga teacher. Um, yeah, you're doing like yoga retreats all around the world. Um, is that something you did um, from the start, basically, or is that something that came in later, um, um, additionally to the, to the audio work? It came in later. I didn't discover yoga until I was in my early thirties, mm -hmm. um, and fell into it by accident. Really, I, I went to a gym and they had different classes on for free for part of the membership and. I went to a yoga class not really knowing what to expect and absolutely loved it straight away. Um, so that became my new obsession. <laughs> and after about five years of, of, of doing that obsessively, I decided to learn to teach. And so that became another little sideline. Um, and then people found out I'd done my teacher training and started asking me when I was on the road, if I would, you know, bands and, and crew members would ask me if I would, I would do some classes after sound check and things like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing that, yeah, and that's I've I've taught on every tour I've been on I think for about the last five years now. <laughs> okay, nice, nice. Oh, that that's very cool to combine those two. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Um, and so it's, um, when I'm not on the road, I I um, run yoga retreats in lovely places around the world. So. Fantastic. I'm not very good at staying still for very long. I like to move around. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, 
the, our, our uh, weird times that we're in right now must be especially hard for you. It's a challenge. Not, I don't think I've been home for longer than three months in my entire adult life. So this is, yeah. I feel you. I feel you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's stay positive and uh, hope that we are going to get out on the road uh, very, very soon again. Um, speaking of that, you would have been on the road right now, right? With uh, Westlife. That's right. I would have been, yeah. Oh, man. And you, you actually, I mean, we spoke before about that. Um, you were planning to take out uh, the new uh, DMI Clang on that. Um, so Yeah, I was so excited. I was already there with my Quantum 7 and the DMI Clang and I was like, yay, new toys. <laughs> and then literally a few days before I was due to get on the plane, I got the message saying, don't get on the plane. <laughs> oh. this, this may not be happening or some of it may not be happening. And then, yeah, here we are. But ah. it will be happening at some point and I'm really excited to get to play with my new toys. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Can't wait to see that. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about um, a, a really, really cool project that you were working on, um, Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds. Mm. Um, that is a quite unusual and pretty big production that, that you did there. Um, it is. Not, not, not just in terms of uh, you know audience size or something like that, but you have a whole lot of people on stage, right? Yes, it's um, it's a full orchestra, mm -hmm. and nine other musicians uh, playing you know gu guitars, keyboards, bass, you know the more the more rock and roll type um, mm -hmm. instruments, and then we have actors. It's a it's an adaptation of of an old. Um, H.G. Wells novel about an alien invasion. So we have people who are acting and singing and then there's a whole lot of sound effects and uh, alien spaceships that come out of the roof and it Ooh. fire breathing aliens. And it's, it's this huge prog rock extravaganza oh, wow. uh, with a very big channel count. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many channels were you handling there? Oh, I should have I, I should have looked at my piece of paper before, shouldn't I? Yeah, but it was uh, uh, we're, we're around two hundred. Oh, okay, nice. You were using an SD seven, right? Yes. Sweet, sweet. And um, yeah, you you got in touch with us um, um, before the production because you wanted to use um, Klang on that production as well. Um, and you were using it uh, mainly for uh, for Jeff for the for the conductor, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, so what, what, what was the idea behind it? Why, why did you go to the Klang direction for, for this production especially? Um, because Jeff was the composer and the, the creator of this whole thing, he produced it. He wants to hear his work recreated. He wants to hear the record, but played live. Mm -hmm. And with such a lot going on, I felt like it was a hell of a lot to try and cram into a stereo mix. Mm. And having met him and seen how he worked, I knew it was going to need to be quite precise. I knew there was there was not a lot of margin for error. I really needed to, to get this working very well for him. Um, so I had a chat with Simon Honeywell, who was doing Front of House, who was actually the guy who gave me my in at RG Jones. Um, and we agreed that Clang would might be a really good way forward to create some space hmm. within Jeff's mix. And because it's Simon was mixing in surround as well, we felt it was a nice reflection of what was going on up front. And Jeff is very um, embracing of new technology. We thought he'd be into it. So we we went along to his place. We, we did the, the Clang demo app with him and he was quite taken aback by the difference. It was like, well, yeah, we have to, we have to do this. So he was on board straight away. Cool, cool. And how, how did it work out for him um, during the tour? He loved it. He absolutely loved it, yeah. Nice. Um, it, was, it was a different way of working for me, not so much because of the clang, because that was actually incredibly in intuitive and, um, and easy to set up and, and very user-friendly. I had to embrace a lot of time coding um, because the snapshots that I needed to, to run we needed things like certain phrases, like eight bars needed to, to come up for the cellos in his mix and then go back down. Mm. And that would, and then every time that phrase reappeared, it needed to, to come up a few dB and then go back down again. So I ended up time coding the whole show up so that I could 
there was no way I was going to be able to do all these cues manually. Mm. Um, so that was that was lucky that I had that. I also had to learn to read music and follow along because he was using working with an orchestra. He was using musical references to them as to where we were going to start from next bar, whatever. So I needed to be on the ball with that. <laughs> so it was it's it stretched me as an engineer. I definitely came out of it a much better engineer than I went in for sure. I learned a lot. Nice, nice. Yeah, that sounds like an, like a very interesting challenge. Yeah, cool. Yeah, well. um, but since since that production was before we introduced the digital uh, desk integration, you had mm. to use Clang as a standalone tool. Um, aside from that, um, how how did you do that? Did you did you mix uh, Jeff in the in the main layer, or how how so, did you send the audio back and so forth? So I. I had his, I had all of the rest of the people on stage pre-fade and mixed Jeff post-fade off the master faders. Mm -hmm. So then that was what was sending to the clang. I had the clang faders set at zero so that I was, I had the, the surface of the, of the seven to, to mix on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Okay. So that made it quite easy for you to, to just work with snapshots and all that stuff, even before the integration. Um, really easy. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Didn't, and but the, obviously the, now that with the integration, we have the opportunity to do that for everyone. Yeah, that's why we did it. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were all um, working on that for for a long time to just actually make that happen because um, it makes sense. It makes stuff much easier. Um, mm. So um, the regarding the positions of the signals that you that you placed around mm. Jeff's head. Was it something that you changed during the show or was that more or less static? No, it was it was static. The only sort of movement was with within signals that were already coming in. So there were some sound effects channels, for instance, where alien warships would travel around his head. And <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't done by me. That was that was already in, in the stereo panning in the programming. Mm -hmm. um, so I left things static. He's static on stage. He's when he's during the performance he is conducting. Mm -hmm. So um, I was able to lay things out largely as he saw them for the live instruments and then have all of the ancillary stuff like the sound effects and there's a, a fair bit of a fair bit of track mm -hmm. um, on there for, for various other things. I could really set those out quite wide or low or you know, we had you and I had some interesting conversations about psychoacoustics and what the how the brain perceives different placements of sounds, mm -hmm. and so that really informed where I was putting things. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Hey, um, you sent me actually your clunk file from that production, so let's take a look at that. Mm. Here we go. Oops. All right. So. Um, Let's take a look at the channels that are in there. So as you mentioned, they're all at one level. Um, mm -hmm. And um, OK, so let's see. So HD, I, I assume that's a hard disk recording? Hard drive, like, yeah. Like, like, yeah, hard drive, OK. So we have that. And then you have those surround and surround rear and uh, mm -hmm. effects and effects rear. So those are basically quadraphonic, right? So basically just four points. Yeah. And all the panning yeah. is already in the in the in the um, recorded files, right? Exactly, exactly. Cool. But whereas before I would have had to put everything just in a stereo mix, I could actually put the rear at the rear. So he was having the real experience. Nice, nice. OK, uh, must have been interesting when the first time uh, um, a spaceship was flying from behind, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not something I've ever mixed before. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, Little, little question on the side, just out of my curiosity. Um, you mentioned that the front of house mix was also in, in surround. Um, do you remember how, how that was done? Was, was it using like something like Elisa or Soundscape or um, was it just a uh, quadraphonic? It, ooh, I'm going to get in trouble here because I'm not going to know the answer. Um, it oh, wasn't fine. Elisa. Um, it, was, it was different hangs around the room. Mm -hmm. but it, okay. yeah, it wasn't Elisa. Yeah. Okay, nice. All right. Cool. And then in red, we have the drums. Um, and then let me see, bass, some guitars, some keyboards and the orchestra. So the orchestra came just in as a stereo submix, I assume. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that Simon sent me a mix of them. Um, 
and oh no, did I don't have them as highs and I'm just trying to think now because I think I kept them. Yeah, so I, I had sub mixes of them from Simon. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Let's take a look at the positioning. Um, let's go straight to the elevation view so we can see all the parameters in there. Okay, so yes, all the all the hard drive the, the 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 playback signals are spread there. Um, you have a very very wide placement. I love it. Okay, so mm. you were really using all the all the available space in there. It's there. Why not use it, hey? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. So um, the surround effects. I'm very curious about those. Ah, yeah. Okay. So you just place them. Um, wide in the front and a little bit narrow in the rear. Cool. Mm. All right. Nice. Um, did you have the impression that um, movements around were going smoothly or did you have to, to redo uh, some of the, the, the width of the panning in there? I had a little play around with it, um, with, with the effects. I didn't move things around too much once we'd found a place that he was comfortable with because obviously he was happy. Um, sure. We did we did have a little play around with the effects placement mm -hmm. just to feel what felt like you say smoothest. Mm -hmm. Okay, very nice. Okay, the orchestra is behind him. Interesting. Mm. He he was he was facing the orchestra, right? He yeah. Was probably having the, the back to the audience, right? That's right. Yeah. Nice. Okay, but this so, I, I I assume this this allowed him a better separation between that and the other signals. Uh, exactly, or, because uh, the, the other nine musicians are in front of him and they're all multi-instrumentalists. It's not just one guy does guitar, one guy does keys. They all play about five or six different instruments. Mm -hmm. And so he's got this sort of pocket that he's sitting in of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And then he's got the, the live or the, the, let's call them the rock and roll musicians in front of him, providing the more... Um, attack kind of feel i okay. guess you call it yeah so so more 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 presence and, and more directivity i would i would assume yeah nice so i sort of used used a blend i think with clang for me there's two different ways you can you can approach it you can either go with a studio feel to it, a studio production feel and and place things very creatively or you can go with a who's in front of you and place things exactly as they are on the stage. And we settled on a, a kind of blend of the two. Got it. Very cool. The, the drums are also spread really wide. I love it. Okay. The yeah, overheads really are like quite narrow the in the back. Front and back. Um, if you can see down the bottom. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. I bet that sounded pretty cool. I wish I would nice have, could have visited yeah. you back then. <laughs> you just have to come next time. <laughs> Absolutely, I will. Nice, okay. Um, you were also using Klang on um, a part of the Anastasia tour. Um, do you see a difference between an application like at War of the Worlds with, you know, all of those signals and a more orchestral and effects heavy mix and a pop show like Anastasia? Is there a, a different approach, something that comes to mind? Yeah, um, I felt, I mean, obviously the, the channel count on something like Anastasia is, is much smaller. We're talking, a, you know, a, a five, six piece band, her and, a, and what, a couple of backing singers. So it's a much smaller channel count. What I really liked about it was, again, the space it could create, the sense of space it creates. But one of the drawbacks I think about IEMs, and I really like mixing for an ears, but I think one of the drawbacks can be that people can start to feel like they're in this isolation god that word again <laughs> and they they start to have this very playing in their own head to a stereo mix kind of feel going on like they're playing in their bedroom to a backing track almost and i think that the three bringing things into the three the 3d domain gets rid of that problem because you can place things on stage as they would feel if you were able to just take your ears out and hear everything acoustically, even the things that don't make an acoustic sound. Mm. And I think that really gets a band playing as a band again mm. and, um, and digging in a little bit more and gives a bit more vibe. Mm. Did, you, did you feel a difference in, in the way that the musicians played as well as 
communicated and requested things from from you for the for the monitors? Um, I mean, I was still in the early stages of playing with it, mm -hmm. uh, with Clang at that point. But I don't know if there's a difference in the way they would communicate so much as it was impressive how much we could bring down a central element of someone's mix. Like if you can bring a click down for a drummer who traditionally has a very, very loud click, mm -hmm. that's, that's potentially career saving. That's not yes. just a bit cool. That's, you know, that's mm. really, really important. So that's kind of my favorite thing about it for, for, mm. for a practical application. Okay, so, so to just get the mix a little bit more evened out um, and not have those, those huge spikes of volume for some signals, right? Exactly, because you've got this, you haven't got to cram it all into this space here. Mm. You, it feels as though you've got this whole wide, the, the whole of the stage to play mm. with. Nice. And so everything's not fighting for space. Very cool. Got it. Hey, we, we actually got uh, a few questions in already. So one is from Christoph. Hey, my friend, how are you doing? So um, he's asking about a singer. Which position of the voice did you put most often? Or singer asking you middle, front, Whatever, um, I, I think that was um, referring to the to the War of the Worlds production. Ah, uh, so um, the singers there, we had not, I think, oh, how many was it? Eight or nine different singers, I think. And because Jeff himself isn't actually singing, mm -hmm. I would position them in, in in more of a spread across his mix. Okay, nice. So he has. A, but if a there was two of them on stage, for instance. Mm -hmm. They were, and they would be having a sung conversation with each other. I I had them placed accordingly. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. Did you did but, you um, follow any any positions when they were moving on stage, or did you just prefer to just keep them in reliable positions? I kept them in, in reliable mm -hmm. positions for that. But I think for you know I think if what Christoph is asking where I, where I would put a singer, um, the place that feels most natural for a singer is front and center mm. um, so yeah which is which is actually really interesting um, because um, when when we started designing the system we assumed that um, the own signal no matter if the voice or keyboards of a keyboardist or guitar of guitarist would mostly be placed just in stereo without any 3d processing just in the middle of the head and just everything else around it and there mm. are there are um, quite a few monitor engineers who are using it like that but it turned mm. out that um, actually, a, a huge majority of the people are preferring that position right in front. So, um, yeah, it seems that... Is that where you're putting it with your band? Yes. Usually yeah. I do, yeah. I mean, yeah. it depends a little bit what people are asking, but um, mm -hmm. for the most part, that is the, the, the place that is most popular for, yeah. for those signals. Um, I think it's really important that that's a good, good time to actually have a really good play with it yourself when there's i mean if you've got the ability to do the um the virtual sound check thing that's mm -hmm. great or even if you you can just have a a sing in the mic while the band are playing unplug your you know mute yourself to everybody else if you have to but really get a feel for what your singer is going to be hearing mm -hmm. um that's that's a really good thing to do don't just assume mm -hmm. that that makes sense um speaking speaking of communication with the with the artists um did, did Jeff request certain positions um, around his hat, or did he just completely give that into your hands? Was he, he, gave, very he was actually that? very generous and, and gave, gave that over to me and liked what I was doing, um, nice. liked the sense of space. So that was, that was generous of him to, to trust nice. me that way. <laughs> that, that makes it easier, yeah. <laughs> um, there's another point from Zeke. Zeke. It is incredibly late for you in California. Wow, I'm, I'm very impressed that you're here. <laughs> Have a coffee for us, my friend. Okay, so um, let's, let's see what we wrote. Uh, I assume the conductor used the live energy to fill the frontal perception, reason for the rear setting placement and clang technologies. Um, oh, I think that was, that was um, still back from when we were talking about the positioning of the orchestra and the live band in mm. front. Okay, yeah. good point. Thanks, Zeke. All right, 
Um, let's talk about some, some general um, things. Um, were you using um, um, a lot of effects for that production, uh, like, like reverbs and delays, or was that ar already happening in the, in the recorded tracks that were in there? Um, not delays. I used reverbs a fair bit on each individual singer's vocal according to their preferences. Mm -hmm. And the normal places that you'd expect it, a little bit on the, the snare and the toms, acoustic guitars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice. And did you use ambience microphones in that production? Not on that one, actually, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think. Yeah, I guess, I guess Sorry, a lot going, of open back orchestra back a mics. Now, I don't think I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess an, a lot of open orchestra mics can work like ambience microphones quite a bit yeah. as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And uh, generally in, in other productions like um, Anastasia and, and Westlife, uh, I assume you're using um, ambience mics. Do you, do you have any favorite positions or does it completely depend on the production and the preferences of the artists? Um, it does depend. I mean, I have some go-tos, but it, it obviously did, depends on what they want. And, and a lot depends on... It can change from venue to venue if you are having to move where the subs are. That's kind of been my main challenge to, to get them high enough that they're, they're picking up a whole picture of the audience, not getting too much sub and also not getting one person in the front going, row going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's always, it seems that, that wherever you're pointing them, there's always a group of, of people who are just discussing word politics or something in the middle of concerts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, not, that's not a good vibe for your artist. <laughs> Nope, nope. Okay, so there's um, uh, a question from Laurent. Um, do you change the source position during a show? We talked about that a little bit before. Um, maybe, maybe looking into um, the next chance that you're going to have to go out with Westlife, um, where you, mm. you want to use um, DMI fully integrated, uh, where positions can also be stored and recalled in the digital snapshots. Is yeah. that something that you would consider to do? Um, or only if it would be requested? I would be, I'd need a good why. I'd need a good reason, I think. Um, familiarity is absolutely key, I think, for people when they're performing and anything that, I feel like my job is to make, give them their, their happy space, their comfortable space where they can rely on things being as they left them. And so they can just, ignore the audio really and get on with doing their job of giving on a great show That's a very so point. if there's a good reason to yeah for example if they were doing a um an acoustic number where the acoustic guitarist came down front and center and sat with them mm -hmm. front of stage yes in that sort mm -hmm. of scenario and you, maybe the drummer comes down and he's on some some congas or something then yes mm -hmm. i would i would bring that sort cool. of movement yeah, in yeah. but no, if, it, if it's all pretty much the same setup, I'm not going to stop moving things around. Okay, yeah, that makes total sense. Right, so there's a question from um, Matt. What are your favorite ambience mics and where do you end uh, to physically place them to get a good balanced signal? Um, um, I normally go with um, a shotgun star microphone. Mm -hmm. um, not forgetting your windshield if you're doing an outdoor show because that can get interesting. <laughs> um, with Anastasia, she, she very much likes a, a, a real feel of the audience. So I tend to use a shotgun mic and a, a close position mic and then also something with a, a wider polar pattern and do a blend of all of those. Um, physically placing them, I generally go quite far stage left and stage right on the stage and kind of a roundabout head height mm -hmm. if you're standing on the stage so that you're getting a again a true picture of what you would be hearing if you took your ears out mm -hmm. okay very nice okay um all right um cool so um ambience mics are are a quite quite interesting part of, of the of the whole um, placement in there, um, but just taking a little bit of a um, of a, a sidestep from 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 audio, um, and just back to just your general job as a as a monitor engineer. 
Um, mm. I know we, we talked about that when we did that, that uh, seminar together in, in London before, that there are basically three main skill sets that a monitor engineer has. Um, the audio skill set, of course, that's, that's part of the game. There are some business skills, you know, that just keep you afloat and just get you to new jobs. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we both agreed that the biggest and the most important part of the whole thing uh, are the people skills. Yes. Um, can, can I pick your brain on a couple of things? Um, when, you, when you're working with a, with a new artist for the first time, do you have a strategy to quickly read them, if that makes sense? You know, to just figure out how they communicate and what they want, what they need. Do, do you have anything that, that you could point towards that, that works well for you? I, I do. And it, actually, this is something that's, that's developed for me in recent years. And it's come about as a byproduct of training as a yoga therapist. Because one of the things you have to learn as a therapist is the art of active listening. And so active listening is um, things like, well, first of all, really listening and not thinking about what you're going to say next. Actually picking up on words that they use more than once, little golden nugget words, and then reflecting back what they've just said to you to make sure that you've understood mm -hmm. is really helpful. Um, I suppose that's probably skipping forward a bit to actually understanding when, than when you're working with them rather than the, the immediate quick, can I read them quick? Can you read them? I guess it's body language as much as anything, <laughs> but, um, but what's key for me is that they want to feel confident. They want to feel that they can trust you. And so how you present yourself is, is critical. And so I like to, you know, I, I try to go in with an air of being friendly, confident, professional, and above all calm. Hmm. They don't want a head up monitor engineer. They want somebody that they feel is a stable presence at the side of the stage that they can trust. So, I, yeah, but body language is a big one, actually. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, but, but being, being and reflecting a calm, calm manner in there, I think that's, that's a very, very in interesting point. Um, but just whenever, that's, that's the ideal situ situation, you know, everything is prepared perfectly, you know, mm. everything is working out, there are no sudden extra wishes. So then it's very, I would say, more or less easy to be a calm presence on stage left. Yeah. What happens if something goes wrong? Like really unexpected, you know, like <laughs> when, you know, I mean, we, we try to be as redundant as possible, you know, whenever we can. Mm. Um, but um, a stage setup is a complex setup and you cannot prevent everything from potentially failing or somebody running against something, breaking it or something like that. Um, how d did you ever have something like a showstopper or something like that or something really drastic yeah. and, and do you have any strategies how to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's there's a lot going on in live shows these days and the, the sort of the more poppy ones particularly. And so it's not even necessarily an audio thing that's that there's an awful lot that can go wrong. It's better not to think about it too long because you'll send yourself crazy. But you do need to have but Having said that, you do need to think about it in advance and, like you've said, have redundancy and have your plan Bs. I think the most important thing, though, when it's when it's really gone wrong is that you've had your commu lines of communication organised in advance. So mm -hmm. if something's happened, let's say there's been some sort of um, threat backstage and they need to get the artist off stage mm -hmm. or you know, something outside of the audio realm. You've got to know who's going to communicate that to the band, to the audience, uh, to, to the artist. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to manage that without people running on stage like headless chickens? So having protocols set up beforehand of, um, is the stage manager going to do it? Am I going to do it? Am I going to speak in their ears? Is the stage manager going to come and speak on a mic by the monitor desk? If it's a band that aren't using ears, is a guitar tech going to go out on stage and say, so? you know, you have to have that sort of stuff um, kind of war gamed in advance, really. OK. OK, so so bottom line is just prep, prep and more prep. Prep, prep, prep and then communication. Have mm -hmm. have your plans of. Yeah, what's what's the chain of command? Mm -hmm. Nice. OK, very good. Um, going back a little bit to the to the audio side. Um, so um 
we were talking about that a little bit before about things like 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 bus processing. Um, there are a lot of monitor engineers who heavily load, you know, all the buses with plugins and all kinds of things to, um, you know, do like a studio kind of mastering for for the for the aux mixes. Um, but you mentioned that you don't generally do that too much, right? No, um, I'm I'm very much uh, I take a very simple approach, really. I mm -hmm. think that getting the right mic in the right place and, you know, okay, not so much but bus processing, but, but you know, the, cha the channel processing right from your input is use the tools that you've got really cleanly and well before yeah. you start adding stuff. And it's pretty rare that I'll start doing anything fancy because I've, that's an approach that served me personally well. Mm. Um, you know, really good gain structure, use your filters, th those sorts of things. Get, get the, you know, EQ out mm. stuff that doesn't need to be in there. Um, you know, there's the classic example would be a kick drum. Mm -hmm. I'll generally do a, a, a sort of W shape because there's a lot going on in the mid range that it's just muddying the waters. I want boom and I want swack and I don't want a whole load of mud in the middle. So I'll EQ that out and make space for other instruments. And so that's the approach I take the whole way from the input to the output is just get things clean, simple, get the fundamentals right. And mm -hmm. generally I find that it then takes care of itself and don't use a lot of external processing or plugins or anything like that. Very good point. Yeah. yeah. So, so just actually taking care of like the basics instead of just trying to fix it in the post-production, like it would be done in the studio yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yeah. You, 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 you know, you, you've got to build the foundations before you can wallpaper the house. <laughs> makes, makes total sense. Yeah. Um, generally, how, how do you feel about compression on, on, on IEMs uh, or compression of, on, of the, the, the individual signals? For example, lead vocals, would you split those channels and, and give the, the artist less compression than the rest of the band or do you try mm. to balance it? Well, with the quantum stuff, I can, I can have different things for everybody, can't I? So that's exciting. Um, I think you have to be very com careful with compression when it's for the person that's playing that instrument because they need to have a true picture of what they're doing. And if you over compress something or if you over gate drums or if they're not getting a real reflection of what they're doing, Mm. then they're kind of flying a little bit blind. Mm -hmm. And you're, I don't, personally, I, I don't feel like I'm doing anybody a service by, by working like that. I, I, but so, yes, I would, I would perhaps split a signal and might compress it more heavily for, for somebody else that's not mm -hmm. the person making that particular sound. Okay, nice. I see. How about um, reverbs? Do you have any, any go-to things or s stuff that you l learned to avoid in, in, in with, with reverbs and effects on, on IEMs, considering that they take up quite a lot of room in the mix? Mm. Um, I guess I don't tend to put a lot of reverb on other people's. I, I use a reverb on a person's own vocal, but I won't necessarily send anything like as much reverb on other people who are singing with them, if that makes sense. So I'll have an individual reverb. I don't tend to do group reverbs. So I'll have an individual reverb for each person. And then I will generally apply the reverb mostly to the person whose, whose signal it is in their own ears. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. That makes sense. Um, give me one second. I just uh, need to switch is over. All right, cool. Um, for the people watching us, um, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to shoot them all over to us. Um, don't be shy. We're here to answer all of those. Um, in the meantime, I will just satisfy my own curiosity. <laughs> but you guys don't have to listen to my questions alone. Ask everything that's interesting for you. Um, oh, perfect timing. There's one coming in. Uh, here, okay, so Zeke again. Um, it sounds like Becky is an early adapter to digital consoles and Clang. 
Um, is there a preference to run sessions in 48 or 96K? And same between the original SD mic pre's and the new 32-bit blue ones. Is the added resolution a welcome honesty to you or, or the artist? Yes, I love 96K. Um, I think it's a subtle but welcome clarity, um, particularly in the the real high kind of, I would call them super Ks, the real high frequency stuff that you're not necessarily conscious of hearing, but it, it definitely crisps things up. And we actually, um, when the 96K thing first came out, um, I, we actually set up on Westlife to, to switch between 48 and 96 and compare. And yeah, we definitely felt that there was, both myself and front of house felt there was a worthwhile difference. And nice. same with the 32 blue input modules i love them yeah and you know i'd have them on everything budget doesn't always stretch to that <laughs> but i will definitely have if if budget is is an issue then i will certainly try and get the blue strip for um for the vocal channels mm -hmm. even if even if the rest i mean the rest of them are great too yes the mm -hmm. sds but um yeah i'll try and get the blue ones for the vocal channels cool nice yeah that makes sense um do you use any any outboard gear or do you always stay uh, within the console. So no no external compressors or EQs or, or preamps or something like that. Um, in the early days, I used to use a, a DPR-901, which was a B BSS unit that's a um, multi-band compressor, which I do find quite in, quite useful. Um, but now that they're on board, I don't need to don't need to carry one of those around. But <laughs> yeah, that's that would probably be my most frequent use of compression is the multi-band because you can just smooth out any, any little crunchy harsh bits um i do like a tc6000 reverb i don't necessarily always always use it it's depending on the artist um if somebody has a very particular um approach and wants very nuanced reverb i might take a tc6000 up but again i find the onboard ones are absolutely great for most applications mm -hmm. Nice. Um, you, you're working pretty much exclusively with Digico boards, right? At least since since quite a few years. Yeah, um, I Yamaha was sort of my first digital desk, mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested to see the new PM5s. Um, but yeah, I kind of I went out as a tech. I'm just trying to think when it was now. It would have been about the early 2000s with the, with the original D5. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, from 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 fairly early on, I, I became I was sort of bidestial between <laughs> Yamaha and, <laughs> and Digico. But yes, D Digico is my desk of choice. Nice, nice. Is it a workflow thing or a sound thing or both? It's both. Um, it was it was workflow initially that really drew me to them mm -hmm. because I. Even, you know, back in the D5 days, I just found uh, the way everything's set up just feels really intuitive. Um, and it was like, well, where, okay, well, if I'm looking for something, when I'm new to a desk, where would I, where would I reckon it would be? Where would be the place I would put it? And, oh, there it is. It just felt like, it felt very intuitive to use. And the more time I can spend not having to, peer down at the desk and be looking at the band, which is where I should be looking, mm. the better. Um, and then having been forced into situations as we inevitably are of having to use other desks, um, festivals and things like that, then I became more aware of the, the, the sound quality difference as well. And mm. yeah, so I would cool. always come back to my digital. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, we got a couple of other questions and from Marty. Do you rely on snapshot automation, duration, autofollow, TC, to ensure time-sensitive cues are not missed? You mentioned that you were using that on, on uh, War of the Worlds, but do you do that yeah. generally a lot? Um, I do. It depends on the show. If it's a track-heavy show, I do use snapshots as a general rule. Um, because even if the tracks have been done really well, uh, there's going to be places where you, you you don't need so much of what's coming in in a particular song. There's different sounds coming in, obviously, per song, 
if you're using tracks. So I find just smoothing that out. I won't necessarily change a lot of what's going on with the actual band mix, mm -hmm. but the hard drive stuff, yeah, I do find it useful for that. But if I was having a, a more, um, you know, straight up rock and roll band, um, just five piece band, no tracks, then no, I, I probably wouldn't use snapshots. Mm. But the automation, yes, I was I was using automation very much on on War of the Worlds. I I would have needed another pair of hands literally to to do what I needed to do <laughs> without it. So it, it it kind of kind of saved me on that. Nice. Okay. Cool. Marty, I hope that answered your question. Um, if not, feel free to follow up. Um, there's a question from Sephora. Uh, hello, Becky. And what is it like doing soundcheck for Westlife? Um, they've been doing it for a long time, so they know what they want. They're very professional. They come and get on with it. And we generally do two or three songs and off they go. And then sometimes once we're, you know, into, into the flow of the tour, they may not always sound check. If, certainly if we're in a venue for several nights, they may not feel the need to sound check. Mm. So, um, no, but it's good. It's, uh, they're very professional. Nice. Oh, that makes it easier. Yep. <laughs> cool. Um, we, we, since we were talking about, you know, automation and, 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 and stuff like that, um, do you use a lot of macros on, on, on the console? Love a macro. <laughs> I love a macro. <laughs> nice. Okay. Do, do you have a couple of favorites? Um, maybe even some unusual ones? Um, I use them, well... The, the ones I set up before I've ever even got a signal into the desk are my, the, the chat room, I call it, which is especially, you know, with everybody on ears, everyone's got a mic on stage. So I have a variety of different ones set up so they can talk to each other or they can talk to front of house or they can talk to the artist. So, hmm. yeah, you can be the switchboard operator. That's kind of my, <laughs> my, my base layer ones. Um, the virtual sound check one is, is handy, hmm. um, of course. And... I got quite creative with um, a reverb and delay one on the last Anastasia tour because there was a new track that she was doing that was kind of quite ethereal and floaty in the in the verses and then really kind of drove hard, really kind of, what would the word be, kind of dirty dance kind of stuff in the in the um, in the chorus. It was it was much punchier. Nice. And so that required a much tighter reverb. So, and then towards the song, it would it would back and forth between a couple of lines of one and a couple of lines of the other. So I was punching in and out between stars of reverb for that because the more th ethereal ones, she wanted a this very sort of spacious, swirly feel to it, and then then she wanted to be in the on the dance floor. So I needed something much tighter and with much less pre delay. Nice. Okay. Mm. So, so you basically were just having one macro that was switching between two settings of that effects chain. Mm. Or okay, yeah. yeah, got it. Okay, nice. Um, cool. and, and and the same with the delay time as well. There was she she would want it to switch from from quarter beats to to eighths. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. a, num a number of repeats and what have you. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, there's a question uh, from Anthony. Um, oh, that's about the webinar from yesterday. That's a you question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, the webinar from yesterday will be available for, 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 for replay. I think um, it's going to be uploaded to YouTube and Facebook or at least YouTube. However, the prototype preview is deleted out of that. That was only yesterday the chance to take a sneak peek at that. Um, for any other stuff, um, yeah, you have to be a little bit patient. Sorry, Anthony. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure if you if you saw yesterday, Becky. We um, we did a little bit of a of a preview for a new Clang product uh, yesterday. Um, I didn't see that. What's that? Haha. <laughs> um, well, it's uh, it's a, a controller. Um, so basically, you know, a, a personal monitoring controller for artists on uh -huh. stage. So it's not so much for your general workflow, I think. But uh, for things like War of the Words or something, it might be a very, very interesting thing for the orchestra yeah. where they can get a yeah. kind of mix and mix themselves on a nice little surface. And I can't say more about that or otherwise I will get a beating from James Gordon. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, you don't want that. 
no, 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 no. no. <laughs> All right. Hey, um, that was that was very very informative. Um, thank you so much for for your input um, and. As I mentioned before, um, and uh, I will shamelessly repeat that again, um, I saw your work, I heard your mixes, and I think you have a very unique and very, very cool approach um, to actually working with the artists and, and doing a great sound on stage. So um, if anybody still has some last questions, now would be a great time for that. If you should remember them later um, and would like to... Um, um, you know, get in touch with us or maybe follow up with Becky. Feel free to just co keep commenting or send us an email, send us a, a Facebook message and we will forward it to Becky and um, make sure that we can get as much input as you guys want and need. Um, on a little um, safe self-advertisement note, um, we're going on with these webinars. Uh, so next week we will have um, our dear friend Jerry Harvey in, um, as a guest in our webinar. So uh, although Jerry is a monitor engineer and he has toured with some of the biggest artists in the world, he also is the founder of Jerry Harvey Audio. So some of the, the most used uh, in-ears in the world. He also founded uh, Ultimate Ears and, oh, perfect, perfect, there they are. Which, which ones are you using? Uh, these are the 18s. Nice. Okay. Uh, sorry, do I mean 18s or am I on the wrong, I'm on the wrong brand? Hang on. Yeah, the 16s. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, yeah, so next week there will be a great chance to just uh, pick Jerry's brain about, you know, all things in ear and how the industry um, progressed and maybe how it will or could progress in the next couple of years with that. Um, let's see, I think there was one last question that I saw in here. Let me just... Oh, there's another question from Sephora. What is like working with other artists on stage? Sephora, I'm, oh, not, sure if, <laughs> if, if I'm, not, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but um, Becky, do you, do you have an answer for that? Or do we need to follow up with Sephora? Um, I'd be more. More information um but i mean they're all they're all different um they're just people so <laughs> yeah everyone's different yeah that is true so sephora maybe maybe if you can give us a little bit uh, um, um, more information of what you're asking we would be happy to get into more detail um there's another question from um anindo uh, how do you adjust the latency of ambience mics that are sent back to the monitors especially for musicians who are far back at the stage and those who are up front uh, or maybe on a ramp? Oh, interesting question. Okay, um, up front, not an issue. I wouldn't send them to musicians at the back. I generally only send them to, to the, um, the singers and the, the, the frontline people anyway. Um, yeah, and when they're out on a ramp, God, the last thing you need is more ambience. You need to get them to <laughs> jam both of those ears in and, and keep, the, keep their mic right by their mouths and so yeah so the the ambient mics are off at that point mm -hmm. but i generally don't really have them up during a song anyway I, there tend to be something that i ride up in between songs to so the the people on stage can have can have a, a feel of the applause and enjoy the vibe of the show and you know if they're sticking their mic out and doing a sing-along I'll, I'll ride them up in them mm -hmm. but they're not something i have ticking away through that throughout the songs okay nice and Nindo, I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, I have one last one that I nearly forgot. Mm. I saw in, in one of the announcements for, for, for our chat today, um, a, um, uh, Andy Banks commented and referred that we should mention why Pierce Brosnan as a monitor tech is very important. <laughs> I could oh, not dear. make sense this of that. Going, <laughs> <laughs> this is going back quite a long way. Um, <laughs> but we were at a UK arena. I can't remember. It may have been Cardiff. I can't remember which one. But there was, for some reason, a life-size cutout of Pierce Brosnan <laughs> as James Bond in catering. And naturally, we felt that he would be a welcome addition to the crew. So he came <laughs> along and 
<laughs> Mix the show with me. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, okay, so in this case, um, I assumed you had to use an SD7 with the extension because um, you know this little extension wing for the SD7, which is called SD007. Yeah. So. Love that. So good. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a long time, but, but I don't think we were, oh gosh, I think I was using an H3000 and I'll my this back then. So it was a long time ago. So he could nice. have one under the desk anyway, because it was out of my reach. <laughs> <laughs> wow, those things were heavy. I mean, yeah, man. Great it's, desk, it's no though. fun to tip an SD7, I have to say that, but uh. <laughs> one of those analog battleships, they're yeah, horrible for the back. Oh, so now yeah. after connection, why you started with yoga? Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Okay. All right. Um, cool. I think that's, um, that's all the questions that we had in here. And my most pressing one is answered with PS Brosnan. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Becky, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to have a chat with, with us today. Um, and I really, really hope to see you on the road very, very soon, as soon as we are left out of the cages and, um, yeah, uh, especially um, I'm interested to, to hearing your feedback to using the DMI, the, our newest baby on, on Westlife. So oh, I'm really excited to use it. I can't wait. Thank you for inviting me on. It's been really fun. Good to see you again. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, everyone, um, thank you all for, for tuning in today. And uh, again, let us know if there are any questions, if you have su suggestions for other webinars, other topics or something like that. Uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, We're happy to work on um, fulfilling all of those questions and requests. All right. Thank you very much, Becky. Have a beautiful day and uh, Thanks, see you all you very, too. very soon. Bye.